Well, we're going to think about Numbers chapter 16, which is the rebellion of Korah. What we're going to read about is him and these rebels getting destroyed for their rebellion. And the oh. earth opens and swallows um, a whole load of people. But the sons of Korah didn't die. And uh, think a little bit about that, because there's a lot of grace in this chapter. Uh, there really is. And that is what we're here to remember. God's grace as it is in the Lord Jesus. So let's um, let's just start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we come to your grace and to the certainty of your love for us, wanting and needing to again be refocused upon that and to be persuaded again of the utter certainty of our salvation by grace. Father, in your word, we see your amazing grace all the way through and your eagerness to save. And we pray that that might rub off on us and that we in our turn might want to reach out with that to other people. And we pray, Father, that you'll help all of us as we try to do that. Bless the uh, situation with church politics in Perth. We thank you for your amazing patience with us uh, as a, a body of believers and as individuals. And we pray that you will guide us all through to greater maturity and to your kingdom. And we pray for the work <clears throat> that Emmy's doing with uh, bringing people, especially young people, to know your saving truth, which is in the Lord Jesus. And we think of Audrey and all the work she does, likewise, online, and chatting to all sorts of people. We pray that you'll bless her, and we pray for blessing on John as well with the things in his life and we pray for gina and her sister that you will help them to be able to care for her and above all as phil reminded us we pray for the lord's coming and for your kingdom because father all of us you have led each of us here to the position where we only want that really and there is nothing else really we desire apart from you and apart from relationship with you and eternity with you when we will no longer be held back by the flesh and, and the society in which we live and our own selves and at last we shall be with you we do pray for that wonderful kingdom to come when at last earth shall be restored to how it was in the garden of eden and man shall walk with his god again so please open our eyes to number 16 please be with us father for jesus sake amen Right, well, you know the story, Numbers 14, we saw Israel came to the borders of the Promised Land, so they didn't want to go in. God said he's going to destroy them and make of Moses a great nation. Moses says, oh, don't do that, and he intercedes, and God hears that intercession, and they're saved. And then they do presumptuously try and go up into the land anyway, and God says, no, you're going to die in the wilderness. But they are pardoned. Moses gets a pardon for them, which I suggest must mean that although they would die in the wilderness, just like Moses did, yet they would also be resurrected to eternal inheritance in, in God's kingdom. And then we had a look at Numbers 15, where you've got all this talk about the presumptuous sin. And I said that the laws that are given in Numbers are related to the historical incidents. And the presumptuous sin, yeah, was Israel in the wilderness, and now you've got in chapter 16 another example of a presumptuous sin. And what we saw in Numbers 14 was that God actually saved, tried to save Israel when they'd already committed the presumptuous sin. And he wanted to save them. He didn't kill them straight away. That's what was supposed to happen if you did the presumptuous sin. He didn't do that. He tried to save them. And he, he wants to save even those whom he has condemned. And that was an amazing grace we saw, and we're going to see the same here. Where Cora and his guys do do the presumptuous sin, and yes, some of them are killed for that, but others, it is sort of a bit recalculated. So let's get going, verse 1. Now Cora, the son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, who were sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 princes, the leaders and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much on yourself since all the congregation are holy, each one of them and Yahweh is among them. Why do you lift yourselves up above the assembly? And Moses falls on his face and says to Korah, verse five, 
In the morning, Yahweh will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. So <clears throat> what's going on here? Well, who is this uh, this Korah? He's clearly the ringleader. Jude talks about the gainsaying of Korah. And, uh, <clears throat> and yet we're told in chapter 26 that the sons of Korah did not die in this. And they went on to write lots of psalms, and you can read these psalms of the sons of Korah later on in, in, in the book of Psalms. It's quite simply, bad men have good sons, and good men have bad sons. And I think that is all the way through the Bible. And it just shows that spirituality isn't sort of genetic. It, it, it cannot, by its nature, be passed on. You can't pass on a relationship. Well, <clears throat> God's intention to start with was that all of Israel, uh, sorry, was that the firstborn of all of Israel would be priests. But after the mess up with the golden calf, that was changed. And the tribe of Levi replaced the firstborn of Israel as the priests. And the work was split up between Levi's four sons, Aaron, Kohath, Merari, and Gershom. Um, but Aaron was clearly the most senior because he was the my priest. Uh, Kohath's family had to be supervised by a son of Aaron. You read that in Numbers 3, a guy called Eliezer. And so, well, yeah, I'm afraid if you were uh, a son of Kohath, um, <clears throat> well, you were not the senior one. God had chosen Aaron. And the Levites, anyway, were led by the son of Eliza Fan, um, <clears throat> who was Kohath's fourth son. So it wasn't quite according to the uh, the firstborn didn't have sort of uh, power. Now, Moses, therefore, and Aaron were cousins of Korah. They were first cousins. Well, Korah was himself a firstborn, but his father was not a firstborn. And he clearly felt a bit discontented about this. He obviously thought that I should have a more senior role than I do. And he gets together with these Reubenites, Dathan and Abiram, who were from Reuben. And when you look at how the camp of Israel was laid out. You can see that on the south side, the sons of Kohath, that would include Korah, they camped there, and that's where Reuben camped. So they were kind of neighbors in the camp. Oh. Who was Reuben? Well, Reuben was the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn uh, of all Jacob's sons, but he was deposed. Well, there's a chip on the shoulder there. As you remember from the whole story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the rah-rah that there was between Jacob and Esau and so on, that in their culture, if you were the firstborn, you were the boss. And uh, everyone wanted to be the firstborn. And if you weren't, like Jacob wasn't, well, you scheme and struggle to try to become equivalent to the firstborn. And God shows all through that record that I don't operate like this. I'm not interested particularly in who's the firstborn. I don't do that. It's rather like in a church today, maybe the guy who's a big guy in the world, who's very eloquent and uh, very intelligent and very wealthy and successful, he expects to also be the boss of the church. Well, no, God chose uh, a road sweeper who's been divorced and remarried a few times and uh, possibly was in prison um, many years ago, so we hear. Uh, yes, well, God chose him to be the elder, not you. Oh, but he doesn't like that. And you see, that's what you got here. And it's unsurprising, really, that the Reubenites, who were the deposed firstborn, that they get friendly with Korah, who is a firstborn. But the problem was his father wasn't. And so because of that, well, he's not quite up the top of the tree as he thinks he should be. Discontent. That's what this is. This is people feeding off discontent. And I keep saying that the Bible is psychologically credible, and that is absolutely the case. 
You, know, you, you go to a pub and overhear people's conversations or in a cafe or something. What are they talking about? Oh, they diddled us. They diddled me on my housing benefit. Oh, yeah, and they did that to my brother. Oh, but I saw through it. Oh, and so did I. I saw through it. And my friend uh, Penny, oh, she saw through it. Oh, yeah, my friend Kathy, oh, they did that. Yeah. You know, these people feeding off each other's discontent all the time. A lot of conversations I overhear running church in a pub are cranky people are feeding off each other's discontent over quite petty issues. But anyway, they all feel like they, they diddled us, but I saw through it. You know, oh, yeah, they're this and the royal they, you know. And this is what you've got, got here, that people are feeding off each other's discontent. Well, <clears throat> they didn't get it from biblical history that God's not interested in you being the big guy in the world. He's not interested in that. That is no qualification to him whatsoever. So they are unhappy, and they obviously want to be in control. You may remember in uh, Numbers 12, Aaron did the same to Moses. He also tried, him and his sister Miriam, tried to kick Moses out as number one. They wanted to be number one. And God nearly killed him, but Moses was very gracious in making intercession for him and Miriam, and so they were saved. And now the same thing is happening to Aaron, that now he experiences what he did to his brother, that he's got people rising up against him and his brother, Moses, trying to kick them out. And these rebels are destroyed, uh, and God wants to destroy all Israel, but it's Aaron who falls down on his face and, and begs God not to. And then it's Aaron at the end of this chapter who takes the incense and runs runs into the into the congregation and saves Israel being destroyed. You see how it is that he experienced what he did to his own brother. And he saw the similarity, and he remembered how Moses had interceded for him, and he then interceded for other people. And that is why circumstances repeat, that what you did to someone else ends up being done to you. And it is not simply because what goes around comes around. It is because God wants to lead you further to mature you so that you then will understand yourself, the implications of your own actions, and you will then with passion intercede for other people. People complain, oh, I don't feel very passionate in prayer. Well, that's partly because you have not been convicted enough of your own sin. Well, the comforter, the Lord says, convicts of sin. And if you have a theology that totally denies any activity of the Holy Spirit in your life, well, you probably won't be very convicted of sin. And these days, of course, it's the worst thing you can do is to convict anyone of sin. You know, because I saw a meme on Facebook that said, I am awesome. So I am awesome today, you know. And so, <laughs> Until we get convicted of, of, of sin, we will not have any passion for anybody else. Um, and we will not see the need to intercede for anybody else unless we ourselves have felt the Lord's intercession and maybe felt the intercession of other people for us. Well, the congregation gathered themselves together against Aaron at the time of the golden calf, and he gives in to them. He says, okay, I'll make you a golden calf. Here in verse 3, they gather themselves together against Moses and Aaron, but he seems to have progressed because he does stand up to them now. And you see again how things repeat in your life, that you may have a test that you fail, but then it's repeated and you don't fail. Or you may have a test that you pass and it's repeated and you fail. Well, verse 4, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. This is in begging them and in begging God. This is a sign of inferiority. This is a sign of, you know, I, I am on the ground before you. Please, please don't do this. Now, usually when males particularly have their power and their status challenged, they meet that by anger and by a show of force. <laughs> Moses, bless him, falls on his face. 
Truly the man Moses was very meek above all men on the face of the earth. And I think you see the measure of the man Moses, really, that he, he just falls on his face. And he says, well, in the morning, verse 5, Yahweh will show who are his. Now, that is quoted in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 2. The Lord knows them that are his, and the them that are his are us. And in this context, in the morning, Yahweh will show who are his and who is holy. Well, the reference is to Moses and Aaron. And yet it's quoted about us. The Lord knows them that are his, as if we are Moses and Aaron. And in fact, when you read 2 Timothy 2, you see a lot of language that's to do with Moses. And I'll read it to you. The servant of the Lord, which is a very common title of Moses, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Israel strove with Moses at Massa, but be gentle unto all. It's Moses apt to teach. Moses taught the people all the time. Patient, Moses was most of the time. In meekness, Moses was the meekest man on earth. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, like these guys who are opposing him, if God, perhaps, peradventure, will give them repentance. And he says, perhaps, peradventure, I will make an atonement for your sin. So Yahweh will show who are his. The Lord knows who are his, us. But here it's talking about Moses and Aaron. So again, you see the call to spiritual ambition to not think that Moses is some stellar kind of white-faced figure as he is seen in Judaism, that, well, I obviously am not Moses. Yeah, you can get the spirit of him. This is the point, that we are called to rise up to the spirit of these men and not see them as, you know, like people in stained glass windows. Oh, Saint Moses. Oh, Saint Aaron. Saint so-and-so. These guys with, you know, white faces and all that. no. We are asked to rise up to the spirit of Moses in this intercession. So what they're told to do, these rebels, is to take censers, Korah and all his company, put fire in them, put incense on them before Yahweh tomorrow. You've got a day's notice, guys, and then tomorrow you've got to bring censers with incense and fire in them and bring them before the Lord. And I warn you, he says, verse 7, you've gone too far. And God's going to show who are his people. Well, he's referring to what happened in Leviticus 10, where the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, offered wrong incense in their censers to God, and God's fire came out and destroyed them. And I think he's saying, look, you know what happened? When people offered wrong incense before Yahweh, they were destroyed. Okay, guys, I'll give you a day's notice, day's, day to think about it. But tomorrow, you bring your incense uh, on your senses with the fire on it and come before Yahweh's presence. Whoops. Uh, yeah, the, the spiritually minded would have thought, oh, yeah, that's what happened to Aaron's sons. And they got destroyed straight away by a bolt of fire from God. Oh, whoops. Yeah, but not do that. So in a way, <laughs> they are being... Not well, set up, well, I suppose set up for a fall, I, I suppose. But I think what God is doing here is saying, look, surrender to me. Just put your hands up and surrender and pull back. You don't want to do that? Okay. Then bring your senses, incense and fire before me tomorrow. Got a day to think about it. And you wonder if that night any of them prayed for wisdom. Should I do this, Yahweh? Oh, God, should I do this? Please guide me. Because the obvious answer from Leviticus 10 was no. If anyone offers wrong incense who's not uh, from uh, the, the, right, uh, the right people, then I will destroy them. So, you know, we pray, lead, lead me not into temptation. And that implies God does lead you to temptation. And here it is an example, I think, of where God did lead into temptation, but they didn't have to go that way. He's bringing them to a point, as he does with every single one of us, where you just got a hands up surrender. I was wrong. I was thinking wrongly. I want to go back. And if you don't, and if you go forward, <clears throat> then you are led into temptation, in this case, into destruction. So... Verse 8, hear, you sons of Levi, Moses says to Korah. I and mean, what he means by hear is not just, hey, lend me your ear. He means be obedient. To hear is to be obedient. Be obedient. 
and he's urgent. Be obedient now. Right now. Okay, tomorrow you're going to have to bring your senses, but I'm telling you right now, surrender. Humble yourself. And he takes the tack, verse 9, is it a small thing to you that God has separated you to bring you near to himself, to do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh and to minister, to serve? That's what minister means, to serve the congregation. What he's saying is, do you not realize the great honor that you have in having been called to be servants? And this is the whole problem. People don't realize that the call to be a servant is a wonderful call. I'm called to be a servant. Well, what an honor it is to serve. But of course, the way of the flesh is not that. I want to be number one. I want to be visible. I want to be seen. I want to be glorified and honored. You know, to clean the toilets in the hall or sweep up afterwards. Oh, no. I don't want to do that. I want to stand on the platform or whatever. Um, but to to serve God's people it is a wonderful honor. I said, don't you get that? You've got honor enough anyway. But of course they didn't. And they didn't, I think, appreciate the, the huge role that they had anyway as Levites. You know, Numbers 8 is very, very clear about this. I've given the Levites as a gift to Aaron to make atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel. And again, Leviticus, the Levites are the one who will serve, the ones who will serve in the service of the tent of meeting. They are the ones who will bear the guilt. So, wow, you can actually save Israel. That's your role. And you don't see how wonderful that is? Well, that's the thing. People are discontented discontented with this, that, and the other. Um, but they don't see that they, the wonder of having been called to serve, called to save people, that you can make a huge difference. And they didn't get it, sadly. So then, <clears throat> they say, verse 14, you didn't bring us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor did you give us an inheritance of uh, fields and, and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? The idea is you're putting wool over you, our eyes, as would be said in English. Um, it, they, they've totally twisted it all around. Verse 13, you brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey, Egypt, to kill us in the wilderness. A land flowing with milk and honey? I don't think so. Their baby boys were killed in the River Nile. They weren't even given straw to make bricks out of. They were whipped, beaten. They cried to God, but oh no, Egypt was a land of milk and honey. They've made Canaan bad and Egypt good. And God keeps saying, I'm taking you to a good land, and Egypt was bad. And you see how it's only, what, a couple of years after they left Egypt. You see how quickly the narrative can change in people's minds. That the world was wonderful. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. No, but that's how people see it. And you, you see, as we've noticed before, how very quickly people keep telling themselves a fake narrative and they come to believe it. They come to be utterly persuaded of it. And we are not somehow immune from that happening to us. And the only thing that's going to forge the correct narrative is God's word, is your reading the text of the Bible for yourself and being humble to that. Well, Moses was very angry, verse 15, and he said to Yahweh, don't respect their offering. Well, we talked about what it means that Moses was the meekest, the humblest man on earth, a huge like accolade from God. He was the humblest man anywhere on the whole planet. And yet he was also angry. So yeah, to, to be humble and meek does not necessarily mean to be quietly spoken and to be generally passive and sort of unresponsive. No, Moses was humble, but he also has uh, anger and emotion and uh, so on. Well, verse 16, Moses said to Korah, you and all your company, go before Yahweh, you and they, and Aaron, tomorrow. And I've said that that was effectively the command to go to their deaths because they'd seen what had happened to Aaron's sons when they offered incense in a wrong way. And, well, okay, 
God is angry. And he says, verse 20, to Moses and Aaron, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. Well, <clears throat> I think that the congregation is the congregation of Israel, because in verse 19, Korah assembled all of the congregation, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to all of the congregation. And looking at this phrase, the congregation, it, it refers specifically to all Israel. So God is saying, look, <clears throat> I too, I know you're angry, Moses, and so am I. I am going to destroy this whole congregation in a moment, literally in the twinkling of an eye. I am going to destroy them immediately. It's exactly what he says about the golden calf. I will consume them in a moment and I will make you a great nation. And that is again what he's saying here. There were Moses and Aaron standing there. And he says, look, you two, just move away from this congregation, Israel. I'm going to destroy the lot of them. And who would be left? Moses and Aaron. So it's God's old plan that he had at the time of the golden calf to make Moses and Aaron a great nation. And to just reschedule his whole plan. You know, he had told Abraham, I will make of your seed a great and mighty nation. Okay, he'd, he'd gone down the track of doing that through the people of Israel, and now he's saying yet again, as he did at the time of the golden calf, right, okay, rethink. I will destroy all those people, and I will go another way with Moses and Aaron and make a great nation out of them. <clears throat> but, again, Moses intercedes. Verse 22, they fill on their faces. And they beg God, and so God changes in that he agrees not to destroy the whole congregation, but instead he destroys the 250 princes and uh, the, the families of Dathan and Abiram, and I guess a lot of Korah's family apart from his sons and Korah. Well, again, <clears throat> you see the measure of Moses, what a wonderful man he was. He was angry with these guys. And God's angry, shares his anger, and says, okay, I'll destroy them. I mean, it, in emotion, in, in hot blood, I'd have said, oh, yeah, go ahead. And I, I I definitely wouldn't have fallen down before God and said, oh, no, don't destroy my enemies, you know. Yeah, but he does. And as we know, the mediation of the Lord Jesus is far greater than that of Moses. So Moses does this. Um, for these irritating people who hated him, who were nasty to him, etc., his relatives, his cousins, who, well, you know how it is with uh, uh, your relatives in his uh, lifetime of you know, different things that have gone on. And, uh, yeah, but no, 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 he, he begs God not to do this. And God hears. And this is nothing like as powerful as the mediation of the Lord Jesus. Well, they fell on their faces and said, Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh. Well, I think the idea is that he's saying to God, Look, you created these people and your spirit keeps them alive. You don't want to destroy them all, surely. He's trying to touch a divine nerve, a nerve in God, by saying, Look, you created these people, you sustain them. You're not just going to scribble like millions of them, surely. And David often does this. He he appeals to God to save him because he says, you made me. Jeremiah, you are the potter, we are the clay. Um, again in the Psalms, that you would show a desire to the work of your hands. One big advantage of not believing in evolution, in its atheistic form anyway, but believing in creation is that God created me. I did not come here by random uh, force or chance. I didn't come here by biology. I came here because God personally created me. I was formed by God, fearfully and wonderfully made in my mother's womb. And so because of that, he will have a natural desire to the work of his hands. And they're appealing to God on that. They're trying to touch God's nerve 
by saying, you are the God of the spirits of all flesh. Shall one man sin and will you be angry with all the congregation? The one man, I guess, is Korah. <clears throat> uh, the gainsaying of Korah, Jude talks about. And of course, this is the whole thing of, of Moses, uh, of uh, Abraham, who, who says the same, doesn't he, about the destruction of, of Sodom. So let's get it. God was going to destroy the entire congregation as he was wanting to earlier at the time of the golden calf. But Moses intercedes and God says, okay, I will not. Um, <clears throat> but I will, I am going to destroy basically those who commit the presumptuous sin. So it's as if he kind of re reframed the sin of the whole congregation and says, okay, so I won't uh, destroy all them then. But why was he going to? Because they went along with their leaders. That's why. And you may think, well, leaders have got more responsibility. Well, they do have, yes. But <clears throat> to just go with the flow, to go with the flow is a sin. That would lead to your condemnation at this at this point in this example. You know, the, yeah. And so I, I think you have to uh, understand that God <clears throat> absolutely uh, does judge people for going along with the flow. And the problem with going with the flow is that because you know your own elders and leaders and whatever, you can think, oh, well, yeah, okay, I don't think much of it, but okay, this is the way it is. It's not my fault. I'm just a little person. But God was willing to or wanted to destroy people for saying that. For, for, for behaving like that. So <clears throat> there is this gap between God stating something and it happening. And it's in that gap that we can intercede with God. And <clears throat> God says <clears throat> to Moses here, 23, tell the congregation, get away from around the tent of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So speak to the congregation again. The congregation who were to be destroyed was the whole congregation of Israel. Moses rose up and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. You think, why does he go to Dathan and Abiram? I think it's because, if you can imagine it, <clears throat> Korah and the 250 princes had gone to the tabernacle to offer their incense. Dathan and Abiram and their families and the rest of Korah's family were standing by uh, by their tents. <clears throat> so he says to the congregation, depart from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. Or literally don't lay hand on any of their stuff. And I think the implication is that they had quite a lot of stuff. They were materialists and people thought, eh, these guys are going to get killed. I might be able to nick some of their gold or some of their donkeys or something. And God says, no. So the implica implication is that they were quite wealthy. <clears throat> That's why it stresses in verse 30 that all that they had went down into the pit. And <clears throat> I've said that the sons of Korah were not destroyed. It says in Numbers 26, 11. They were not destroyed. And when you read their psalms, the psalms of the sons of Korah, they keep on about don't be materialistic. And I, because wealth and all that you've got is going to perish in Sheol, in the grave. Well, that's exactly what happened to the wealth of their family. So, of course, you can deduce that why did Korah and these guys want to take over from Moses? Because they thought they were materialists. They thought there was something in it for them materially that leadership leads to wealth which it normally does in, in these kind of societies so they went away verse 27 the tent of Korah, Dathan and Abiram and Dathan and Abiram came out Korah doesn't because he's at the tabernacle offering his incense and they stood at the door of their tents their wives sons and little ones and I think this is the presumptuous sin, which means literally to lift up the hand. They're standing there arrogantly. Yes, come what may. This is the sin of presumption. Moses said, verse 28, Hereby you will know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these works, for they are not from my own mind. 
So I think he's saying, look, yes, I am your leader, but it was not of my own mind. I did not want to do this. You remember how he fights with God, really? I don't want to do this. Get Aaron to do it. Get someone else to do it. I can't speak properly. I've got a speech impediment. I'm this, that, and the other. I don't want to do this. And so any ministry, it seems to me, is in a sense against your will. And Paul says this when they, these critics were saying, oh, you don't have a, a calling to preach the gospel. And he says, the fact that it is against my will is a sign that it is that I have received a dispensation of the gospel to preach the gospel. So even Paul didn't want to do it. <clears throat> He'd have probably been far happier being an academic rabbi, going around talking to dirty Gentiles. No, that probably was not what he <laughs> wanted to spend his life doing. He was a, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I mean, he didn't want to do that. It wasn't his style. It wasn't his personality. That's what he was asked to do, to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so both Moses and Paul are saying, look, <clears throat> I, I'm doing what I'm doing, but it's not this ministry that I've got is not what I want. And I think that the parable of the talents has been misread uh, because a talent was a weight, and people have misread it as if it's talking about a talent as in my natural ability, as if we are asked to go out and serve God in ways that I actually would rather like to, in ways that are convenient to me. And that is, uh, I think, not. Uh, the, the way we are asked to pick up a cross and I think that all ministry and we are all ministers we are all given something to do there were good works that were set up for you and me to do before the foundation of the world absolutely <clears throat> but a lot of those callings are, are not what we naturally would like to do when people say oh no I don't want to do that I'm not any good at that I tell you in my two hands I've baptized a very large number of people as a result of soup kitchen work. And I can hardly cook. And that's a fact. Duncan running a soup kitchen, oh, that's the last thing. It's not for me. I, I've done it. <laughs> Nearly 20 years I did it. Um, <clears throat> but it was not. It wasn't me. That wasn't me. Oh, and got to sort out the, uh, oh, the roof's leaking and this is leaking and Oh, that's got to be sorted out. We've got to sort out the hygiene regs. Oh, man, that's like not me. That ain't me, huh? That absolutely isn't. But I had to do. And God blessed it because of that. And uh, all sorts of things, really. Uh, we are called to do, I think, what is against the grain. And this is what Moses is saying. Look, I'm here. But this is not from my own mind. I, I am your leader, but I don't want to be. And Paul the same, you know, yeah, because it was against my will, it's the evidence that I was, in fact, called to preach to the Gentiles. And you see how the people really just <laughs> so against Moses that the whole congregation could be against him. That It has to come to this pitch where God says, you know, okay, these people are going to die as a warning to the whole of the congregation. They didn't believe Moses. And yet earlier in Exodus 19, he'd been given signs to do, and God said that they may believe you forever. Well, they didn't believe him, certainly not forever. And so you think again, that they may believe you forever. <clears throat> but you see the conditional nature of how God works. He gives reason to believe that you may believe. But man has still got to exercise his choice. They were given signs that they might believe Moses forever. They didn't believe him forever, but they should have done. They were given the reasons. So, <clears throat> but he says, verse 30, if Yahweh make a new thing, literally, if he creates a new creation, that's what it says in the Hebrew, if he creates a new creation and the ground open its mouth and swallow them up with all that appertain to them, and they go down alive into Sheol. So, even in destroying the wicked, a new creation was made. But we're going to talk a little bit about these sons of Korah. It says here that God was going to create a new creation. 
and that these people were going to go down alive, alive into Sheol, which means the grave, translated hell in a lot of Bibles. <clears throat> the rebels generally were destroyed. They died. But they went down alive into Sheol, and God created a new creation. The sons of Korah didn't die. But we are told <clears throat> uh, later on, verse 32, the earth opened its mouth, swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So verse 32 says, all the men who belonged to Korah, and surely includes his sons, were swallowed up. But Numbers 26 says the sons of Korah weren't killed. So you can assume that they maybe ran away. One assumption, but I think there's something more there. Because if you look at the <clears throat> at the Psalms written by the sons of Korah, and, and there's a number of them in the in the book of Psalms, as this is a psalm of the sons of Korah, they keep on talking about Sheol. If you look statistically, and I did do this, at how often this word Sheol or hell or the grave occurs in the Psalms, a, vast, well, not vast, a, a, a very large percentage of the time, it occurs just in these Psalms of the Sons of Korah. And they keep saying things like, you saved me from, from Sheol. You brought me up from Sheol. I love you. There you get it. They went down alive into Sheol, as it says in verse 30, into the grave, into the pit. But the sons of Korah were brought up out of it by grace. No wonder they spend the rest of their lives writing psalms like praise in the Lord. No wonder they keep talking about, I was saved from Sheol. Wow, thank you. Yeah. And he, Yahweh created a new creation. That's what happened. But <clears throat> these men, verse 30, have despised Yahweh. This is the sin of presumption. This is the language is used about the sin of presumption in the previous chapter, chapter 15. So, yeah, those who committed the sin of presumption were immediately destroyed. Yeah. But the sons of Korah, who I guess in their hearts were different, by grace were brought up. When the ground, verse 31, split apart, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. And their households and all the men who belonged to Korah, that's definitely his sons, but they didn't die. They were brought up out of Sheol. <clears throat> this is particularly clear in Psalm 88, which is a psalm of the sons of Korah. My soul has come to Sheol, to the grave. I am reckoned with those that descend to the pit, to Sheol. Like the pierced through, that's the rebels, who lie in the grave, you laid me in the pit below in darkness, in the depths, separated from my companions. But then you saved me by your grace. Yes, this is a psalm of the sons of Korah. They went alive into Sheol and were brought up out of it, into the grave, into the pit, just literally. That's all he was. They went into this big <clears throat> chasm that opened in the earth and God brought them out by grace. And as I say, deliverance from Sheol is big time. Psalm 49, that's another one. Um, where again, he says that all the glory of man and all his wealth just goes into, into Sheol, into the grave. Like sheep, they are dragged to Sheol, the grave. Death will graze on them, but the upright should rule over them in the morning. It's as if maybe they went down that evening and came up in the morning. I don't know. God redeems my soul from the power of Sheol, they say. Yeah, I've been redeemed from Sheol. And uh, you, know, you, you go through those psalms that, that are called Psalms of the Sons of Korah. They all got these allusions to what happened here. For example, Psalm 84. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness, the tents of those wicked men. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, Psalm 46. 
Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth underneath us is removed. Yeah, I went through it. The earth beneath me opened up and I fell down into the hole. But then I was I was saved. So I do rather like these sons of Korah. You think, well, what were their names? Well, Exodus 6, you got the genealogy. Their names were Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaf. You think, what do those names mean? Well, Asir means a prisoner. Elkanah doesn't use the Yahweh name, but uh, God will obtain or God will get something for me. And Abiasaf seems to mean father of gatherers. He was going to be a great gatherer. I said that they were the children of discontent. That their father, Korah, was discontented. He was a king who was never crowned. And he was grumbling around with his neighbors, Reuben, who were also the deposed firstborn. Just like people being born into a family where the relatives and the parents and the neighbors are always moaning about this and that and the other. Yeah, we're prisoners, yeah. But... God's going to maybe obtain something for me. I'm going to gather something more for me. So they were born into this wealth. They were born into a spirit of petty materialism, obtaining, gathering something more for myself. Pretty bad background. But they rose above that. And no, this is not for me. Don't go dad's way and the way of his mates, the Reubenites, and the, the way of my sister's the way of my aunties and uncles and cousins and the rest of it. No, I don't want to go that way. And so <clears throat> they were saved out of that. They went down into Sheol, but were lifted up out of it. So they were condemned, but saved out of it. Well, that is exactly what we've been reading in the previous chapters, that Israel were condemned people in the wilderness, but they were saved out of that condemnation. They were condemned, and then God says, I pardon, according to Moses' word. So, <clears throat> they went down alive into Sheol. It keeps saying, them, uh, saying this in verse 33. And Israel, verse 34, that were around them fled, for they so verse 34, all Israel that were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up. Well, they've been told, get away from the tents of these people or else you'll be consumed. And they hadn't done that. They stayed around the tents. But when they saw the earth open and start swallowing these tents, oh, they leg it, saying, lest the earth swallow us up as well. So you see how, how totally gracious God is. You could look at it in the glass half empty, that how disobedient were these people? They were very disobedient. But God still didn't destroy them. You know, you see a God who really wants to save. But then back over at the tabernacle, <clears throat> which is some way from these tents, fire came forth from Yahweh. This is where Kor is standing. And devoured the 250 men who offered the incense. Well, it says in Psalm 106, 18, that God kindled a fire to destroy them but they had kindled the fire of incense to, to burn the incense on on their uh <clears throat> on their senses so you see how even in condemnation it is man who kindles the fire and god sure works through that god kindled the fire they kindled the fire <clears throat> well god's doing this of course to vindicate aaron and he uh, as the high priest and he's going to do that in the next chapter with Aaron's rod that budded. But when you think about Aaron, he was so weak at the time of the golden calf. When he actually makes them a golden calf, and then when Moses comes down from the mountain, he lies about it and says, oh, well, nah, <clears throat> the, oh, I just chucked uh, this stuff in the fire, and whoops, a golden calf came out. He, he doesn't repent. I really thought Aaron should have been fired from the job for life. But God doesn't. And here you can see God really going out of his way to justify Aaron. Um, and that he really wants to keep using him. So I find that quite amazing that someone who should have been fired for life over that golden calf thing, if not slain, 
Um, it's not only saved by grace, but their ministry is absolutely justified by God, and God's very defensive of him. I think it shows that forgiveness, God's forgiveness, does wipe out the sin. And it really is more than a play on. It is an absolute dealing with the sin in a way that human forgiveness, I suppose, can't do. But God's forgiveness can do that. He can actually cleanse. It can actually get rid of the sin, as it were. So the census, verse 38, of these sinners against their own lives. Again, again <clears throat> it's they who destroyed themselves. And again, a psalm of court, a psalm 49, says this their way is their folly. So, yeah, their way is their folly. They sin, sin is against ourselves. Uh, and we create the judgment ourselves. Well, they're told to take the bronze censers. You remember the psalm of Asaph that talks about this, that says that he went into the sanctuary and saw the end of the wicked. Yeah, because he sees that these bronze censers have been beaten out, as God says, for the covering of the altar. By the way, in Exodus 20, God says, if you want to make me an altar, just make it of earth. Just kick a bit of earth together. And if you have to use stones, well, don't hew the stones. I just want raw, raw stuff. Um, but God's revelation is to some degree progressive. Here, he accepts that they do have an altar and he asks them to beat out these bronze censers into plates and put it round the altar. So <clears throat> God is hungry and thirsty for relationship with people. And that's why, as I say, the initial idea that uh, I just want an altar of earth, uh, no, it does develop because he sees that people uh, need, if you like, some degree of religion. And then again, God says to Moses, verse 44, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment because the people have come, verse 41, all the congregation, the children of Israel, just shows the congregation is not just Korah's gang, it is the, the whole people. They say, you killed Yahweh's people. Ugh, get real. Um, you murderers. And God gets angry and says, Moses, get away. I am going to destroy these people in a, in a moment. And again, they fell on their faces. Whew. Moses is that close to God that he, he can sort of disobey God almost because God says, get away. What does he do? He tells Aaron, take your censer, verse 46, put incense on it and run into the congregation. God says, get away from the congregation. But Aaron takes the censer and runs into the congregation. I'm not saying you can just you know, disobey God as you want, but uh, I'm, I'm saying that this is a sign of maturity. Like God saying, I'm going to destroy the people and make of you a great nation. Oh, don't do that. And he persuades God, and here, get away from the congregation. I will consume them down in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I'm just waiting for you to get away from them, fall on their faces, and <clears throat> take the... Uh, um, take the fire and the incense and run into the congregation. Now, this whole plague and destruction of the people was spreading pretty quickly because he stands, verse 48, between the dead and the living and the plague was stayed, but those who died by the plague were 14,700. So it had destroyed 14,700 uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and it, there's no time to waste. And Aaron does what Moses says, and he runs into the congregation, uh, <clears throat> verse 46, burning this uh, this incense. And verse 47 says, and he made atonement for the people. A few comments there. One is that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Well, he achieves atonement here with incense. It's like you tear off of something. We ain't got time to kill an animal. The plague started, 14,700 are dead. God says, I'm going to destroy them in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's urgent. You can't offer no animal. Right, grab a bit of incense. Right, offer something. Right, incense. Okay, I'll forgive the people. 
It's sort of like he says, God says to Moses in Numbers 14, I have pardoned the people according to your word. In other words, it was just words at that point. Here it's words plus incense. And yet the ideal requirement was the shedding of blood to deal with sin. And so again, you think about the power of the intercession of the Lord Jesus, who interceded, not only was he a perfect man, and Moses was imperfect, but he intercedes on the basis of his own blood, not animal blood, but his own blood. And how much more powerful is that intercession? And the thing is, we are asked to get that and to also make intercession. When James says, pray for one another that you may be healed. Well, this is referring to this sort of thing. Moses praying for his sister Miriam to get healed of leprosy. Here, Moses and Aaron saving the people from the plague. We can rise up to that spirit. We can make a difference through our intercession. People say, I don't know what to pray for. You may not know what to pray for about yourself, but you know stacks of people who are in all sorts of issues. And so <clears throat> the plague was stayed. And, and you see how Moses and Aaron took their own initiative. God doesn't say, well, if you intercede with me, I might stop it. They know God that well to do this <clears throat> and the lord jesus knows the father even better than we do i want to conclude with just one point uh one last point from verse 47 where we're told that he made atonement for the people and the the people are called here several times all the congregation i'm saying that <clears throat> i've been saying that all the laws given in numbers are connected to the historical incidents and in chapter 15 verse 27 we read that if the congregation sinned in ignorance then the priest could make a sacrifice and achieve atonement for the people and now in chapter 16 you read that in this case of presumptuous sin really Aaron, without a sacrifice, just grabbing a bit of incense, made atonement for the people. It's the same phrase used in chapter 15, that if it's a sin of ignorance, then the priest can make atonement for the people. Here, Aaron makes atonement for the people. But there's no way you, you can surely write this whole lot of behavior here off as a sin of ignorance. They had seen God acting. The, the ground had swallowed and opened these, these uh, uh, swallowed, opened and swallowed uh, the rebels. And they said, oh, Moses and Aaron killed them. You know what? They're murderers. They just stabbed them to death. Bit of opposition. Moses done brook opposition. He went and knifed them. But guys, no. This is just presumptuous sin. And yet they are forgiven as if it is a sin of ignorance. And I said that about Israel going up presumptuously into the land of Canaan, that, yes, they committed the presumptuous sin. That's why the command about the presumptuous sin comes after the record of them having done this when they uh, refused to go into Canaan and then tried to go into Canaan in their own strength. Yeah, they did the presumptuous sin, but... God pardoned even the presumptuous sin. They had to die in the wilderness, but with the hope, if they wanted it, of resurrection. And so it is again here. It's the same. They have sinned the presumptuous sin, and God's decided that because he's smiting them down. But because of the intercession of Moses and Aaron, that presumptuous sin is kind of reframed and reinterpreted as a sin of ignorance. And this explains, as I said last week, two difficult for me passages. One, when the Lord on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Well, they did know what they did. And yet I think he's trying to, he's asking God to see it as a sin of ignorance. And it explains Peter's words in Acts 3 when he says, I know that you did this through ignorance, that you crucified God's son through ignorance. Anyway, therefore now repent. Was it through ignorance? I don't think so. 
this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. <clears throat> but right, he reframed that sin, got God to see it as a sin of ignorance. And the whole crucifixion of the Son of God was forgivable, it seems. From the Lord's own words and from Peter's words, that was forgivable because it was re, I don't know, regraded, I suppose, as a repurposed as a sin of ignorance. This is helpful to us in coming to forgive other people. I can only give, give example from my own life. As most of you, I think, know I, I was attacked by a bunch of slanderers in the church that I belong to 20, 25 years ago. And the slanderers, absolute slander, and they kicked me out of their church. And I struggled to forgive them. <clears throat> what I did was wrong. It is wrong to make up lies about a person. It is wrong to trash somebody's family, to wreck multiple relationships. But over the 20, 25 years, I look back and I see that the lives of literally thousands of people were negatively spiritually impacted by those guys. And yet I can say, Father, forgive them, because they didn't really know what they were doing. They were, of course, responsible for their sin, but I do not think that they appreciated the huge destructive dimension of what they were going to be doing, of what they, what they did, uh, of how that would go on over 20 years. They say, oh, it's all Duncan's fault. Oh, this one's fault. Oh, that's their fault. Well, no, no, it was their fault. Uh, I'm sorry, but it, it, you don't make up lies about somebody and, and wreck their life uh, uh, and, and wreck the lives of multiple people. But did they see how bad it was going to be? No, they sinned pretty well in ignorance to some degree. And, yeah, I'm happy to see their sin as a sin of ignorance rather than getting worked up about, oh, but they, they're responsible for this, that, and the other. Well, yes, they are, but then I think that much is was not intended by them and was a sin in that sense of ignorance. This is how God dealt with people, with little human beings, crucifying his beloved son. He looked at it as a sin of ignorance. The Lord looked at it as a sin of ignorance, when it sort of wasn't. And we're seeing this here with Israel in the wilderness. We saw it with Israel in Numbers 14. We're seeing it here, really, with, with the congregation here in Numbers 16. That <clears throat> They've done a sin of presumption, but Aaron makes atonement for the people. The previous chapter has just said the, the people can only get atonement made for them by the priest if they have sinned in ignorance. Well, it's trying to reframe it. They, yes, they did it, but they didn't realize the huge dimensions of what they were doing. You know, And you, you see that when people come to forgive adultery, a partner having an affair or whatever. Yes, the affair and the unfaithfulness is there, but the partner... <clears throat> probably didn't realize, didn't appreciate that that sin of having the affair was going to have or could have multiple, multiple destructive outcomes, that it could lead to their children becoming drug addicts, it could lead to suicide, it could lead to this, that, and the other. They didn't realize that at the time. So to that, in that sense, yes, they sinned, but there was an element to which it was a sin of ignorance because they didn't foresee, <clears throat> didn't appreciate quite how awful it was what they were doing. And that, as I say, is one path up the mountain towards forgiving others. Instead of screwing up all the time over, ah, but this is happening because they did that last year or 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, instead of screwing up like that, that oh, this is happening because they did that, to think, well, Father, forgive them, for they, they knew not, not what they did, and they know not what they do. They really don't. Um, they know not what they do. They are wrong, they are culpable, uh, but forgive them because there's an element of ignorance there, of the dimension of the consequence of their sin. 
And I find that helpful. And I see that God, if you like, finds it helpful in forgiving people for crucifying his son. He was open to persuasion on this, even back here in the desert, with Moses and Aaron interceding with him, getting him to recalculate the, the presumptuous sins as sins of ignorance. But that is not to say that he does not judge. I mean, the earth opened and swallowed those guys. Korah and the 250 princes were smitten with fire and destroyed, and that was the end of them. You know, God will judge sin, uh, a presumptuous sin. I'm not saying he won't. 14,700 died. Well, I've rambled on, <clears throat> but these are these are very deep, uh, very deep things, and we are really up against God's absolute grace to us in all these things. We really are. So let's. Uh, <laughs> how can you give thanks in words for all this kind of thing? I it's very difficult, really and truly, it is. We take the bread as the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus. Um, yeah, this is true. This is real. These wonderful things really happened. This God is our God, and the Lord Jesus, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He is our Lord. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In that sense, God likewise is unchanging. <clears throat> His grace to save his basic core personality is unchanged from everlasting to everlasting. He is God, and God as he is. So, <clears throat> don't know, Phil, could you uh, try and give thanks for the bread? Sure. Heavenly Father, we come before you now, and we are so grateful that you are in charge, and you have not left, despite the appearances of the state of the world today, you have not left man in charge. You are in control. And you've shown that through throughout the Bible. And we know it's true today. And we know it's true because you were willing to sacrifice your own son. And we just thank you that you are willing to be a forgiving father, an understanding father. And we just can't wait for the time when the Lord Jesus will be sent back to this earth to re-establish your kingdom of peace, of righteousness, and of holiness. And we long for that time, Father, we are excited by the prospect. And we thank you now for this emblem, this piece of bread, symbolising his body, and we are that body. And we thank you that, and we thank the Lord Jesus for going through with it to the very end to give himself and us victory over sin. We thank you in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, in this cup, we see the symbol of the blood of the Lord and, uh, you know, grace that cannot be described, really. Um, the path to salvation for condemned sinners, which is us. Um, I guess, Mark, if you could um, give thanks for that. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, with gratefulness, that can't be expressed in just mere words. We want to have hearts to to express it in the way that we love you and the way we are forgiving and patient for other people around us. We, as we come to take this this wine, a symbol of the Lord's blood, we have been made aware that we ourselves actually stand in the company of the condemned because we have not really appreciated the great love 
uh, that you have had towards us and the, the great position in life that you have placed us. We've all been somewhat dissatisfied with our life situation. And we haven't realised that we have been saved from condemnation and given life eternal through this blood that we have been, that we're about to drink now. But you are saving us out of condemn, condemnation because, because we do put ourselves in the family of the condemned. We do judge ourselves. And now, once this blood has been shed, we come to you with prayer and intercession, asking that in your tender mercies you still be God and Father to us. And we thank you for bringing this all to our attention through this one, your Son, that we come to remember now. Amen. Amen. So this is the symbol of his blood for us. Well, uh, Audrey, would you like to, uh, con oh, oh, John, would you like to conclude with a prayer? Yes, please. Um, uh, dear Lord, we thank you for this chance to, to come together as always and to also worship together and and to remember what your son had done for us. And we also pray that you will continue to bless these meetings. And also each and every one of us and our families and friends too, as, as time goes by, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.